Not everyone in the world has a chance to study watchmaking at the Swiss level. That's why here in the little Swiss city of Lelocchi, Henry Corpora teaches at KHWCC Watchmaking School. We are going to give them a visit today and see why, how and what they do here exactly. Let's go! Welcome to KHWCC, which stands for Kendrick's last name, Corpola, and Hof Hof's yeah. Watchmaking Competence Center. Center. Yes, yeah, sorry for the long name. <laughs> it's kind of hard to remember everything, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, if you uh, spell it out, it makes much more sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us, you have been a watchmaking instructor since 2004. Yes, correct. Why do you do what you do? I first got into watchmaking in Sweden um, by mistake actually. I didn't want to be a watchmaker because I was uh, afraid that my math wouldn't be good enough. Uh, but I still wanted to work with my hands with something uh, fine and not too big mechanic because you can see I'm not really a strong guy. Uh, so then I was thinking, okay, maybe if I become a goldsmith, uh, that might be a good option for me. So I applied to the goldsmith school, but there was no chance because I was only an average student. Uh, to get into the goldsmith school at that time, you had to really have top grades. Hmm. So because it suddenly became popular. And then uh, uh, the second alternative, okay, maybe I try uh, to, to go to the open uh, week that they had for the Swedish watchmaking school and just try it out and ask them how difficult the math will be. So I did that and they said, don't worry about the math at all. So then, oh yeah, that's great. And then I will also learn uh, micro machining, small parts and so on. So that was really interesting. When I started, it was called Stefan Skolan. That was the mm -hmm. watchmaker who was at that moment uh, the main guy of the school. And then I think they later changed to the Vostep program mm -hmm. uh, together somehow with the Swedish program. I don't know the details really. At what point did you, and why, did you decide to come to Switzerland? When I was in the Swedish uh, watchmaking school, I read uh, a magazine that they uh, received called What's the Happening? And I was reading this and my big dream was, oh, maybe one day I can, maybe when I'm like 40, 50 years old, maybe then I will have saved the money to go and take their, their refresher course. And then I started to, to of course, uh, uh, save money for that. And I had it in the back of my mind that one day maybe I have the chance to get to be a student in Vostep. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that was, you know, uh, much uh, more thinking in the future. So I got the watchmaking job immediately after the, the course. And uh, I still had, uh, were thinking about it. And uh, I was gathering money where I was working. It wasn't a high salary or anything. So I couldn't do anything except just save money. Um, and after three years, I had the money and then I, I just applied, actually. I didn't want to go directly to Vostok because I didn't think I would be qualified and good enough. Mm. So I was thinking, let's uh, somehow prepare it before and maybe I get first a job in, in USA. Okay. And maybe they can teach me a lot of uh, tips and tricks before I take the big leap to go to Switzerland and learn mm. from Vostok. Mm -hmm. uh, so I applied to RGM, uh, the okay. watchmaking company. It was a yeah. big favorite of me uh, and I still love that brand. And I applied there and they really, really tried hard to get me in there. But mm -hmm. uh, due to the visa, it was basically impossible. This was in year 2000 around. But mm -hmm. they then um, uh, recommended a company in Switzerland called Ventura. Okay. Uh, because they were doing after sales service in America for them. And uh, then they recommended me to them. And uh, I applied mm -hmm. and I got immediately accepted. And I, oh, okay, so I don't go to America, I go directly to Switzerland. So I had to, to take that chance. Uh, 
mm-hmm. and I had exactly I didn't have enough money actually go to go to America uh, to to Switzerland at that point, but I had enough to travel there, so I had to take a loan with them, with the company to buy the, the small set of IKEA furniture and so on. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> and I didn't do a bench as nothing, so I could have also been kicked out. So I would have then wasted three years of savings. Uh-huh. But I I really wanted to take because it's a you know one one time in your life that you're young and you can do this kind of uh, chances. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I got the job there, and it was shockingly hard. And uh, yeah. because uh, the things that they they did exactly uh, the things I didn't learn, and that's encasing. Mm-hmm. The cleanliness, the Swiss cleanliness, is absolutely insane. We didn't learn that in Sweden. We learned micro machining, mm-hmm. making parts, and those kind of things, and restoration of old watches. Mm-hmm. But there, it was making nothing except you just put the. Uh, you put the dial and hands on to the movement, but very, very precisely and perfectly. Mm-hmm. And no dust must be absolutely surgically clean. And then you have to put it in the case and it has to be every dust particle you have to take out before and they check uh, very, very carefully. So that was shocking because I didn't learn any of that to, to the, the, the level they have in Switzerland. When you realize that, it is especially the things you didn't learn, did it make you happy or did it kind of... Uh, no, no, uh, what happened, panic, big, big panic. I just okay. panicked and worked the hardest I could to survive so that I wouldn't lose my job. Mm-hmm. Because that would be a question six months later. So they would then ask me, so what are you still doing here? You're not fast enough with the production. That's mm-hmm. actually what they asked me. Which was a good motivator because it put, puts you on, on a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no chance but to succeed. Yes, yes. And then I also had to, well, not immediately, but six months or eight months later, I had to talk with them. Um, I had to learn German to the level that I can conversate uh, technically with their clients. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that six months as well. That was six to eight months also, yeah. And then, um, or suggestions, I know that I would have probably been kicked out. Uh, but mm. uh, good, good. Um, uh, learning, very tough learning, but very good learning. Mm-hmm. And then I went on intens- I took an intensive course. Uh, so I went three times a, a week, two hours each time. Uh, and I learned it so that I could communicate more or less in German after the six months. And then I could uh, answer the, the questions from clients in the after sales service. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I, I did was a huge mistake uh, because we don't really use it so much in, in Sweden, polite form. So you have, um, in German, you have, um, see, yes, do, do und see. And then I said do to the, the client. <laughs> and, uh, and I was talking and I didn't, I was not aware of it. I was just yeah. talking like, like I was just talking getting to a things friend. Done. Yeah, yeah t- getting things done and so on. Uh-huh. And then, okay, the cl- client sounded okay. And then click. Five minutes later, uh, the boss comes out and extremely angry at me. Mm. And then, oh, what <laughs> happened? Yeah, because the client called back to the boss and complained, your watchmaker uh, is really arrogant and rude Mm -hmm. or something like this. So so then I was really told off. So it it was a hard, hard, hard life in Zurich, but it was totally worth it. Okay. (laughs) I don't regret it at all. I had an an amazing time there. Mm. Clearly you persevered. Yeah, I survived that. And uh, yeah, once you survive something hard like that, you, you, you become more humble, you become Mm. more relaxed. Mm. For, for, for future uh, hard, hardships similar to this. Okay. There are some things with making watches and uh, the production, you cannot rush these things. So you yeah. have to be very careful not to take off too much material. I'm sure Correct. there are hundreds yeah. other things which you have to be very calm and in a, in a place of equilibrium to actually do this successfully. So how did you manage to balance that with with the whip of uh, almost being uh, kicked out from the company, but still having to rush to succeed? Uh, you have to just, it goes all inside of you, and you just have to kind of uh, give up. You, you, can't, you, can't still, you still can't have the pressure, so mm. you, you can't allow yourself. You just have to accept the, the fact that if you become nervous, you're going to break things and lose mm-hmm. things. You're just like, oh, I'm just going to do this, whatever happens. Yeah, I will yeah. Do and the best you will do the best you can, and you can't do more. So you uh-huh. have kind of cornered yourself. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So there is nothing more you can do. You're in a, actually in a very good position now. You have uh-huh. only one single task, do the best you can. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And okay. that was a very, that's a, 
it's good to be in these situations sometimes in life, I think. Yeah. Because then you can just be there and yeah, let's just do it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you fail, oh, that's actually just good. Then you learn something. Mm -hmm. True that. Um, if you never fail, I'm not sure you, you, you learn that much, to be honest. I yeah. think you have to fail to understand the thing that you're learning really deeply. Mm -hmm. And then still keep going and, and still that, yeah, keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's something I also learned in, uh, in the military, which I didn't process in that way before is that uh, once you put yourself into that uncomfortable position and you give yourself no other chance but to do it, yeah. then you have really taken yourself a level higher because yeah. you, you just, uh, you basically eliminate any chance for error and you, you just accept it, take the responsibility if it happens and then just uh, reset and Absolutely right. give yeah. your best yeah. again. So, I uh, absolutely understand that. I'm still yet to go that way in watchmaking. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. the path which you have already walked, but let's see what happens. I have another question, and and uh, this is more relating with uh, perhaps your experience and uh, what you have observed from your students. What does it seem to you after all these years? What are the hardest skills? To, uh, to learn and to master in, in the field of watchmaking? Uh, it always, uh, on, on average, it always uh, tends to go back to very, very uh, tiny turning, mm -hmm. uh, which they don't have to do on a regular basis as a watchmaker working in after sales service. But it's a, a one of those very high uh, um, classical skills a watchmaker must have. Mm -hmm. And hair springs. But the difference between those two is that one is micromechanic and one is only adjustments. The hairspring, you don't, they don't have to melt the metal and construct this, the, the spiral and so on. In fact, they get a hairspring that is too long and then they have to cut it to the correct uh, length in order to have the right frequency on the watch. Uh, but it's very tiny and delicate. And when you're learning it, it's very hard for many students, but not all. There's always one, it just goes really easy, easy for. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the majority, uh, they do struggle to learn the hair springs. But la later, when they have learned it uh, and bent hundreds, if not thousands of hair springs, then once they have done that, then it's actually very easy after that. But I think with the turning, they struggle through the turning. It's very, very hard to turn, shape something very, very small by hand. Mm. And I think even after when they have mastered it and they can do it very well, if they let it go for six months or, or one year, then it's still going to take them some time and some difficulty to get back to the level they were before. Mm. I don't feel that with Harris Prince. Mm -hmm. I think they can very quickly go back to the level, the top level they had. Uh, even if they haven't done it from from years, okay. but with the turning, it's harder. I would say it's kind of like uh, being in uh, a sp sportive or athletic. Uh, For level sure, all the time. So if you, you want to keep it, you have to practice it yes, all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. If you have practiced it uh, on production for like 20 years, you can probably also leave it for 10 years, and when you go back, it's just still perfect. With eyes closed. Yeah, yeah. There are people here in Switzerland who are like that, actually. It's just yeah. incredible. But then they have done the same thing repetitively for a long time, like hair springs. Those guys, they can do in minutes the perfect hair spring. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, the same with other specialists here in Switzerland. Just mm -hmm. in incredible human beings. Okay. And, um, but as you say, yeah, it's like a sport. Or sometimes it feels like it, it's like learning a musical instrument, even. Mm. So when you're yeah, learning yeah. it, it's like it sounds, you have to think. So you, you have mm. to sound, okay, did I hit the uh, right string and so on. So it, it sounds horrible when you're learning the, the guitar playing. Mm. But then after some time you start to, oh, I'm getting it. You're, you're starting and now there's a flow to it. And with time, you don't even think about doing it. You just do it and the sound comes out. Mm -hmm. And you're more of like feeling it. Yeah, you have done, when the learning is become, it's then like you're programming on AI, I think. And then it has to fail with everything first, mm -hmm. so that there is only one single path forward. And I don't see why would it be different for, from us. I, mm -hmm. think, uh, I think you can study AI to understand human beings. Okay, I didn't know that about you. It doesn't come off in anywhere on your online profiles. 
I mean, I'm, I wouldn't, you know, uh, put a ship in myself yet, but I do like uh, what they do with the AI and all technology because I'm hoping that, or actually I already know, it will help me in the future for the restoration. So I'm waiting uh, for the future to to get faster into the future, so I get my machine, so I can do more precise and better restoration of all the all the antique watches. I still I still would have to do the hand decoration. That that would not be possible not, uh, in the future, maybe either. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, for so that's why I'm interested in technology. I'm sure our viewers also are curious about if they come to learn and yes. study here. Yes. How, how are their days going to look like? And okay, yeah. What will yeah. they be doing here and what's the structure? It's uh, two year long mm -hmm. and quite intensive. It depends a little bit where in the course we are. So in the beginning when they start the course, they, they learn the big machines which we have here behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's bigger machining actually and they learn to make first necessary tools uh, that they would use later for uh, watch assembly or watchmaking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that means this is a period that is very liberated. They just, my goal is to make sure that everybody learn uh, good filing, turning, sewing, all the, uh, the basic fundamentals must come in, in the, these few months for the micromechanics. So that's how it starts and it's very, it's kind of artistic and sometimes they, can, they want to make their own tool or, or a special shape on a tool. So it's very, very liberated in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, then after that, uh, the winding stem course starts and it's a, it's a rather uh, involved uh, uh, product, you have a square which they have to file by hand, you have a slot that they have to turn, uh, they have to learn to make threads and turn several cylinders and a pivot which they also could uh, burnish or polish. Mm. Uh, and that will be much more of a uh, disciplinary course. So it would be just a winding stem, there's nothing else to do for several months now. Mm -hmm. So that's all they do, just winding stem after winding stem to, to get uh, to learn the precision now. So that means that section would not be at all creative. It would only to be. It would be very to to focus on the same thing, and that's one section dedicated to hand turning. They get a watch with a broken balance staff, and they have to turn a balance staff, and then later on in the second year course they have to fit it together and time it. So that's a huge satisfaction for the students. So in the first year they make this tiny staff. Uh, and then they have to wait and have patience for six months or eight months until they reach uh, the, um, the, t the correct time. I emphasize uh, strongly that they get the maximum number of hours during the two years they are here. Mm -hmm. Because that's how you will build experience. You can't just, oh I got it, I made one pivot gauge and then you've spent five hours turning. That won't make it, you have to push in the 200 hours or whatever is necessary to, mm -hmm. to master it. Mm -hmm. So I emphasize quite a lot on that, uh, uh, that they are, are going to be here most likely more longer hours uh, or more time than a regular school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I stay here also longer, so they would have of course then uh, more uh, teaching hours available as well. Mm -hmm. And I often mm -hmm. come in on Saturday and Sunday, so, okay. and some students even come on Saturday and Sunday as well. So it, it, when students come here, do they each have their own uh, table that they sit at, or yes, does it yes. rotate? And so um, does everyone come in every no, day. No, the two-year uh, class, the full-skill course, uh, they have their permanent bench for the the, the two years. Mm -hmm. So they know their band stuff is safe and sound there. If they learn to lock, because uh, you know, uh, if they don't lock the drawers for the important stuff they have, maybe somebody comes in and takes it or, or breaks it or something. Or maybe you, like a drill sergeant in army would, would, yes. would just, yeah, what are you talking about? I, I, I used to actually do this uh, as, a, as a joke, to take the, the most uh, important tools they would need in the morning. Uh -huh. If somebody, because I, I want them to get the habit to lock the doors, uh -huh. because sometimes you could have an expensive watch there and yeah. maybe your colleague is yellow at you and maybe he takes it and you lose your job. Things, yeah. things like this have happened, so, yeah. so I want them to have the habit to lock the drawers once mm. they, they go home.
Yeah. And and if if every time when they forget to lock it, they don't get their tools and they have to ask me and it's embarrassing, then it will come an automatic the habit. Yeah, so they go through the pain and they learn the yeah, yeah. learn what is necessary. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not ex it's not as hard as, as the, the military, but I take some inspiration from that because it's great for learning. Mm. <laughs> sure. I cannot imagine the faces of, 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 of your students when they realize something that they've yeah. done for months is missing. Yeah. Where is that piece? <laughs> is but that these guys are good. They they yeah. are very very uh, yeah. I like them. They follow yeah. orders. So they've been uh, teached well. Yes yes. <laughs> Luckily, yeah. All right. Cool. So, uh, can you show us around and Absolutely. Uh, show uh, show what uh, what there is interesting in in your workshop and what Absolutely. you uh, hold in the highest regard? Yes. Let's start with the machine room where everything starts for the students. Sure. The students and me uh, shared this room uh, to, to learn to use the, the classical uh, machines. For example, if you take a look at this Hauser machine, it's, it's actually, the, the main principle, it's just a simple drilling machine, but it looks very complicated. And if I move now uh, the X slide here, that means we can go left and right with this one. Mm -hmm. So and here you would have a spinning tool uh, that cuts an end mill or a drill or something. Mm -hmm. And then you have the piece that you want to produce, you would have it uh, fixed here for security. Okay. Here and back it should not be more than 3000 of a millimeter yeah. error. But we never work on this size, so we would work 10 times smaller with the main plate. So you divide that value by 10. Okay. So that's how... Uh, uh, potentially how precise this machine actually is. That is very precise. Yeah, people are screaming now for these so-called tripods which we use for black polishing of watch parts. They don't know where to get this. So I try to help them to make them and sell them for a good price to them. That's and after it would look like this, this is my, my private one. But okay. it, it has been DLC coated. Right. And it's done with all Everything except for this part here, this is Bershorn, uh, okay. the pin wise. Everything else here is made here. Um, and the students would do the same, but with their style. But certain things they have to respect, certain dimensions they have to have exact, but certain other dimensions they are free to design how they want. Mm. And uh, so it's, it's, I blend it a little bit, uh, the, the tools that they are making. Some tools they have to follow exactly what is written on the drawing, or they would get penalties when I when I uh, uh, grade it. So e every tool, every exam is graded in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I get a tool from a student and I have to grade it, um, I would first look at what is the function of the tool. Is the function of the tool there? If it is, yes, okay, then he has succeeded the function. Mm -hmm. The next part would be dimensions. Are all the dimensions within the tolerances from the, the, the drawing? And if there's one tolerance that is not intolerance, they would lose points. Aha, okay, so they learn how to follow the sketches and drawings yes. that they are presented yes. in, uh, in the process of actually manufacturing the part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a very important skill if, if you want to go and work in a uh, big uh, watchmaking house, for example. Yeah, it's fundamental. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, they learn to follow drawings, but after I will give them a tool and they have to draw uh, this tool, so then okay. they also learn the drawing, and after they have uh -huh. to make that tool according to their own drawing. Okay, so, so it goes both ways. Yeah, I try to cover all the fundamentals in micro uh, mechanics, uh -huh. such okay. as those things. What are the other machines that uh, see a lot of use in, in here? Uh, this machine is extremely uh, versatile, because you can transform it into something else, hmm. uh, which makes it very good for prototyping. Okay, cool. Talking of stripes, can this be used to make Geneva stripes? Yes, we also did it, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's why you would need this head, which have two angles. Because to do the Geneva stripes, you would have to angle the disc that you're cutting with. A little bit? Yeah, you a quarter of a degree or something like okay. this. But some uh, watchmakers I have seen, they even uh, use it to cut gears, wheels and pinions with it. I don't use it for that purpose, but you can. It's a very powerful mill manual milling machine. So imagine a CNC machine, uh, but you remove all the digitalization. This is my Geneva stripe model. If this is your face, the main plate or, or the, the bridge, uh, if we cut like this, 
you're cutting here and here and all around. Yeah. So that means that we get one circle and next circle and so on. But you're not supposed to have that when you do Geneva strap. You're only supposed to have a semicircle. Yeah, from all the, the time. Corner, so yeah. From the corner of the circle. Exactly, yeah. So that means that we would have to, if you want to do Geneva stripes, we would have to angle it so that this part doesn't cut. Uh -huh. uh, if we do too much, now it's only cutting here. So that would be a very thin stripe that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can see you would have to, if you want to touch from here to here, I would have to be this angle. So it's, it's a relatively small degree. And if I would draw, or if we would have ink under here, then it would make stripes until until here. Here it stops touching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it will make from here to here a stripe. And then this is revolving and moving forward. And, and copying these lines, and that's Geneva stripes. Okay, you made us smarter already. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's relatively simple. When you are in the process of uh, working with these tools, they're massive. They some of these probably weigh like a ton, you know. Yeah, almost eight hundred fifty kilo. This one. Okay. Yeah. And when you're operating this, how much room is there for actual feeling, or do you actually not oh, yeah. feel much, and you just go with the visual cues and? Numbers? Those two, you you would if you do what I do now, you have feeling. Then, then you, you can feel the counter pressure when you're cutting. Mm -hmm. But that's for uh, tool size. For watch size, uh, you have no feeling at all. Yeah? Okay. You would have to use your eyes uh, and, and see how, how the drill is behaving when you're drilling, for example. Mm -hmm. and, have, uh, and you must have uh, broken many drills before. There's no, you, you must have uh, had made many mistakes before you have a kind of feeling for it. But you, you won't feel it in the machine anymore. Okay. Because everything is too heavy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and even in the in the small eight millimeter lathe, at a certain point, if you have to drill a small hole, you have no feeling. It's just too small to to, to feel what you're you're doing, and that's where uh, the experience have to kick in. Mm -hmm. uh, that means you have to drill many small holes uh, to to get an intuition to when it's time to uh, change drill or 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 stop. The, the drilling before you break it or something like this. We have a very small loss on, uh, on uh, drills and, and cutters. And we also learn, uh, we also learn to uh, restore them. So, so many times we can actually uh, uh, re-grind them and reuse them. If they, if they burn a drill or a cutter, we can often uh, reshape them. Because we have this diamond cutting machine for hard metal drills and cutters. And we can then refresh them if they get blunt or worn out. This one is rather light, so if you're turning something hard, medium, large size, you will definitely feel when you move these uh, slides. But uh, you, you would have rather a, either a, a boom stand microscope over it, so you're looking in with a microscope if you use this for small parts. I know watchmaker who actually turn the smallest part with this because it's so stable. Mm -hmm. So some watchmakers may actually turn balance stuffs even with this, which is really odd. But in a, in a sense it makes sense because the accuracy is of course far greater in a larger lathe than a smaller. You lose accuracy the smaller something becomes and you gain accuracy the more mass you have in movement for example. So the head would have much more mass in movement mm -hmm. than on 8mm lathe. So, so using these machines it's not that difficult because they are precise in themselves just because of the size of them. They are much more rigid, there's much less vibrations. Mm -hmm. and much less play everywhere. So when you're turning with it, that's the first thing you would actually notice. You don't want the piece that you want to turn circular to wobble, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not moving in a, in a circular fashion. You want, when you put it in, that you just see a, a part coming out and it's turning, but it doesn't go like this. It's just turning around. Mm -hmm. uh, with a smaller 8mm lathe, when you put something in, it's gonna Wobble. It's yeah, not, just not that precise. Even, even the whole lathe is wobbling. Yeah, that's sometimes. definitely not good. <laughs> exactly. So you would have to, if you use the small lathe, which is very practical at certain times, mm -hmm. uh, you would have to uh, ha have skills to compensate for uh, that it is not rigid and, and so precise. So you would have to be a better watchmaker using a smaller lathe than the large. These are by nature rather accurate. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. What about the production speed? You know, there are some people in the world that uh, decide that they don't drink alcohol, they don't yeah. uh, do any drugs, they don't uh, even drink coffee and eat only plants. Yeah. What if you get a student here that decides that they don't want to use any electronic equipment? That, for example, they want to make a watch using nothing but mechanical and electric free uh, equipment. I mean, theoretically, you could do it, mm -hmm. um, but it it doesn't seem so uh, smart to do. Because uh -huh. if you have a little bit of electricity, you can at least make this head turn around. Yeah. You know, and then you operate it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would call just a, a manual machine. Uh, it's still not, it's not automated. The CNC, you program it digitally, mm -hmm. and then it does its thing. Uh, but I still see this as kind of handmade made things. Even if I'm not holding the graver, I'm still moving this manually. So I need to really know what I'm doing. But I am losing some feeling compared to real hand turning, where you're actually holding the cutting tool in your hand. Yeah. Which is very nice and romantic. Uh, but it would also be a very, very expensive product. Uh, because you would have to spend two or three times longer than if you would uh, use a, a lathe with a cross slide where you can see very quickly measure also. Mm -hmm. So I would do that the hand turning for certain parts of the watch just because it's uh, faster. And then certain other parts I would use these manual machines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's, not that, it's not that I try to uh, uh, use high technology to do things faster or anything. Or that I'm trying to use all technology for all technology's sake. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I have all these machines is that it's simply because it's the fastest way I can do something mm -hmm. in with quality. Okay. If the CNC machine could do, do that to me, I would actually have one. But mm -hmm. it just is not fast enough to use a CNC machine compared to if you use this machine. Because mm -hmm. you have to first, if you have to just make one single part, you have to program the entire CNC machine first. Okay, yeah. yeah. And then I have to go to a school to learn to program that. Okay. And uh, in, meanwhile, I have already made it here in, mm -hmm. in a couple of hours or whatever the, yeah. the part. And if, for the, the range of watchmaking that I would do, there would be no difference. If I would make a watch and then sell it, the price wouldn't be different if I had a CNC machine or these machines. Mm -hmm. it, it just wouldn't. I would have to make more watches than one. Okay, so you're aiming for most optimized, most lean and most reasonable processes for production? Yeah, for the independent uh, 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 watchmaker who make mm -hmm. one of pieces to very small series. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And okay. Also because that's, that's the best way to learn it. Yeah, because then you really you're understand all, the yeah. whole process. You, you, every day you do the, the fundamentals. Okay, what about the big uh, production houses that use uh, machines to stamp out parts, etc. Um, are these watches, these movements, are they less accurate uh, in, in function and form? What's the difference from a Formula 1 car engine uh, to a mass-produced Toyota car engine? So when you make piece by piece, you can make each part perfectly fit with the part it's working with. Mm -hmm. in, in mass production you don't work like this at all. Mm -hmm. So you have tolerances. You have some range which you want it to meet yes, and then yeah. when you meet that it, it's yeah. a go time, it goes to yeah. the next stage. Exactly, but you don't optimize the, the function of the, the watch or the car, it's mm -hmm. just now average. It's mm -hmm. uh, like if you have a Formula 1 engine, what it really means is that it's the most, I guess, the most efficient car engine uh, you can have a make, that's why it's so fast. So it's mm -hmm. everything is just precision for a Formula 1 car, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can watch some uh, documenta doc documentaries and I'm sure they, they will explain it in a uh, similar way. Okay. That sure. The tolerances are just very, very tight in, in that car and then you get more power out of the engine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the moment I am most interested in watchmaking. Yeah. Because it increases all the time, yeah, because yeah. I learn more, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's just progressive. Started uh -huh. with no passion actually for mm -hmm. this profession, but just more and more every year. Okay. That's cool. And uh, yeah, that's just another way, but there's no romantic, my dad was, and, and no, uh -huh. Uh -huh. nothing uh -huh. like this. Yeah, in, uh, in, in Sweden it's probably hard to find someone who makes a watch 
Ja, yeah, there is actually Koss. Uh, Gustafsson och uh, Sjögren. Uh, metal Smith who, who makes this Damascus folded steel. Yeah, okay. And then he makes dials, cases, and then they have a watchmaker and they collaborate and they made a brand. I, I really like that style. So there is one guy, one Swedish guy, and hopefully they will grow and, and maybe even take my students in the future if they, if they grow there. It would be extremely mm -hmm. cool. But other than that, you have only after sales service and restoration and um, yeah, that's it. So it, it's not so much as here. For sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. Load one. We have to soon change. Here you have the RG1. You can see it's this opaque. You can see through it. Mm -hmm. And. Um, it has a very distinctive smell to it. Yeah, that's the ammonia. The ammonia, okay. It's a very, very strong cleaning solution, and that's the one that, that can e uh, crack brass, micro-cracking if you would look very uh, close to it. But I don't know how much uh, contact, and this is only a few percent of ammonia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, mostly water in the end. Uh, and it's fantastic for, uh, for after sales service. You just mm -hmm. disassemble the watch, you, you uh, detect which parts you have to exchange or make new. And then you put it here and it comes out perfectly clean. You put it together, oil it, adjust it. Mm -hmm. So it's very efficient for after sales service also. Mm -hmm. For restoration and after sales service, it's absolutely fantastic machine. Yeah, uh, so it's a uh, uh, very good station for the cleaning. Mm -hmm. Either complete cleaning or you drop a part on the floor, you just go and you clean it. One minute here, one minute there, go through mm -hmm. the rinse. So it's kind of uh, dynamic in that sense. Oh, okay, so if you drop something on the floor, it's going to need a cleaning. You have to sure. always, of course, yeah, we don't have the sec seven yeah. second rule with, uh, <laughs> with food. You, so if you drop something, you have to clean it. You okay. can't just, you know, put it in the watch. Mm. That doesn't work with watches. <laughs> yeah, they are always kind of fighting or, uh, you know, in a playful way, they dislike each other. Yeah. The Finnish and the Swedish, they kind of hate each other in, in, in the fun fun part. So when there is the ice hockey uh, between Sweden and Finland, whoever wins, I'm always the winner. If Sweden <laughs> wins, oh yeah, I'm Swedish, I won. If Finland wins, woohoo, we won, my parents are Finnish. <laughs> so I'm always a winner. So there are some kicks to that. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. But I'm sure when, when hard times would come, I'm sure Finland and Sweden would uh, help each other out. I'm sure. Yeah. They are like, uh, yeah, brothers. And. Um, there was something else you wanted to show us? Yes, the student we have here, we have four at the moment. <laughs> and uh, I wanted They're to really very happy. I wanted to show some, uh, because I think some students, they uh, put out a little bit of work. Uh, what, what they did in the first year and what they do now. Because we all have our own like, little project to repair the watch or the restoration of watch. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal of the end of the year. Because next year, beginning of the year, we have the final exam. So we have a lot of practice before the mm -hmm. exam. So we have better to do the, our own project now. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And y you are restoring a watch? Yeah, I got a watch from Henrik. It's a Jägerle Kutter alarm, alarm watch. And okay. most of the parts are missing. Memo box. <laughs> yeah, the memo box. What do you have? The logo? Yeah, no. <laughs> no it's, it's a lot of parts missing, but yeah. And but yeah, but we will try to find some parts, and if we cannot find, we just made. That's yeah. cool, huh? Yeah. That's super cool. Exactly. At and least uh, you're in a good place to go around and find the parts. Yeah. There's yeah. a yeah. higher likelihood <laughs> here than anywhere else, I presume. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good place to be. Yeah. Okay, can you show us uh, uh, the watch and what, uh, what you're working on? Just assemble the the movement and cleaning and find out the missing part. Yeah, these are the mm -hmm. movements. And there are many parts are missing, like 30, 30 parts. Okay, so we have listed all the parts. Yeah, uh, it needs and yeah, the time and what's missing. Yeah, the missing part is in these two pages and these are the broken parts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a lot of parts. Yeah, that's a lot. 
and that's probably why it's not repaired because it would be too expensive for a professional. Yeah. It's good if the student do this kind of large project, mm -hmm. then the, then they will be done. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And how does it happen that a watch uh, like this uh, has so many parts missing? Maybe the the previous watchmaker do something wrong. Something very wrong. <laughs> and maybe somebody took the parts to repair another watch. Okay. So that's why parts are missing. Mm. Yeah. And then it can also be water. Ah, yeah. For the rust, some parts get so thoroughly rusted that uh, you can't use them anymore, mm -hmm. and you would have to replace them. Water is bad for a watch, obviously. Sometimes watchmakers. <laughs> they can also, if they don't have a good education, yeah. they yeah. can cause a big damage in the watch because the watch is small and delicate. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see that a lot. The no bullshit watchmakers <laughs> kind of, you know, <laughs> it's like it's putting photos there, like, oh, this motherfucker, what the fuck is that? Ah, <laughs> oh, this again, you know, like, who does this? You yeah. know? <laughs> and and mm. all professional watchmakers, they uh, get this every day. Mm. So th there are many bad watchmakers. Makes you think. Like how how people even take their really really valuable watches to these people? There is the, the technical guide for the watch. Yeah, that is from Henrik. So yeah, it's my contacts in AWCI since I collaborate with them and I'm a member. What I can do now is I can go online on the homepage as a member and print out n almost every technical guide for personal use, like uh, for education or for repairing a watch or something like this. Mm -hmm. That's a good point to know. AWC, I have this. Also, BHI will have a huge uh, scan. They will scan all their horological journal magazines uh, and put it online for research for watchmakers. Throughout history? Yes, mm -hmm. from the first beginning even, I think. Yeah. So it's over 160 years old. So you would have a massive archive for research. Mm. And that's, that's only for members also? Or? I think it's only for members also. Mm. I would be part of both organizations. Mm. Uh, I think it's smart as a watchmaker. And you get many services. You get a lot of great uh, around the year short courses. This adds tremendous value to your school, actually. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. And um, yeah, BHI, and AWCI. Those are the two great organizations to collaborate with. Or, of course, Vostep also, if you can. Mm. Vostep is a great school also. Mm. My old, old school. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have two students who are teachers there. Yeah? Yeah. So it's yeah. like a complete uh, circle. Uh -huh. Nice. What, are, uh, what other watches uh, are you guys working CJ, on? CJ, you're doing something interesting also. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on my, my school watch. Huh? Yeah. It's a, a very artistic style. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it will not look like that. It's just yeah, we, we just mod. I just mod. Uh, we modify the the movement for six one eight from six four nine caliber. Okay. Yeah, and this is the the click spring. Henrik designed this a new clicks system. It's not like the traditional one, they make a long curve. Yeah, this spring. is our, I made a new design, a yeah. new interpretation mm -hmm. of the click system for mm -hmm. the 6198 because the original ETA doesn't look so nice. It's very industrial and looks a bit cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made a more classical design. Okay. Uh, and it functions the same. Yeah, the, yeah function the function is, is the, same. the same, just like different the, shapes. the winding here. Yeah, mm. so the clicker is in the middle part. Yeah, and yeah. here it's on the side. On the yeah, side. and you have mm. under all like a wire spring, yeah. which uh -huh. looks very cheap. Okay, so this can fit uh, nine eight and nine seven. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a, a very three dimensional micro mechanic exercise to produce this to mill out the parts and mm. learn hand filing. Uh, uh, pointing and drilling yeah. and measurement. You have all, you learn so much micro mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any functional benefits for for the different uh, clicker? N no, it's it's exactly equally good as the old ones. Yeah, it's just that 
Yeah, it, it looks it, better. It looks better. It looks better, and for for example, you know the um, the criteria in Geneva. There is a hallmark. If you want to have the hallmark of a certain uh, uh, organization uh, like Cosc, but for for quality, there is one in Geneva, and you are not allowed to use wire springs. You can only use classical watch springs. That's one criteria because they look down on wire springs are cheap and uh, classical flat springs uh, are high-end watchmaking. So if you want to have their whole uh, mark on your movement, you cannot do this wire spring system. Mm. So to do the classical uh, uh, spring, yeah, kind of upgrade it in, uh, in, in, a le in a level in watchmaking. Um. Yeah, this was the sheep wire spring. This is now the new. Mm. Mm. You see, it's very ah. three-dimensional. Yeah, and it and it follows the the sign uh, around here. Uh huh. Uh huh. So this one would be here, mm -hmm. and before it looked like this. Yeah, that's a great it difference. And here you have a screw and two steady pins, mm -hmm. so that you can screw it down on the movement in the same position every time. And this is the uh, the click, uh, the new one, and this is the sheep ETA click. So this is the modern style. This is the old classical style. looks worlds apart. Yeah, yeah. So it looks more like a, reg uh, a regular uh, high-end watch part. And of course, this is just a click. Then they have to do also a uh, yoke making exercise. And then what I do, there's an old pocket watch. There is no yoke hmm. uh, because I removed it. This would be the old one which was in the watch, but I removed it. Then they have to learn to design a new yoke here. By feeling, basically? or uh, With from certain from techniques. From certain way of thinking and figuring out shape. Okay, and so they, they would have to learn it before. Okay. Their process uh, in order to, to design something that is missing on the basis of the function. Okay, and uh, can they see the old yoke? How it uh, looks no, like? No. no? Uh, there is no yoke, but the other parts operating with the yoke are there. Uh -huh, and okay. then they have to figure That's out cool, how to huh? do that. Yeah, yeah. That's because cool. it could be a real client's watch. Yeah. You know, and uh, and I did the same for myself. Um, uh, and then I put it away for a long time until I forgot how it looked. And then I made it blindly and to see how different is this going to look from the original one. Or if it is original. And mine actually didn't look the same. This is how mine looked. This is my style. The function is still exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought because of the surrounding part and the design of this one here, you see very round. So I decided to make it more curved and more classical kind of looking. Mm. The so-called original, I don't know if it's original, but this was fitted there. Uh, looks more modern and has sharper lines. So even this one, for me, didn't look like it fits the general style of this movement. So mine looked like that. And other students, uh, they would look slightly different as well. Hmm. So if you have no uh, part and you have no pictures or explanations from old book, what are you going to do? This is the only way you can approach it. You have to yeah, try yourself to get as close to the design of their surrounding parts that are near it. So this is an interesting thing. They start straight away in the morning on Monday. They will get a uh, 6498. But what I have done is I destroyed the, one of the pallet jewels. So it represents an old pocket watch uh, with a cracked uh, pallet jewel. Mm -hmm. So they have to then learn to uh, extract it, not replace it, but repair it. So they have to uh, polish down the face where the crack is until the crack disappears and then shift out the jewel the amount that they removed and then put the watch on the timing machine compare the timing machine to what I did before it was cracked 
mm-hmm. and see if they can come back to the, the same. You already prepared the room. You got for them a little bit of Actually, shell- like. shellac, diamond paste, and this is to cleaning the palette. A a secret. Secret. Actually, no. no, it's way, way better. So this is diamond. Paste. Yes, that's the regular diamond paste that we use. Uh, that I think most people here in this area of Switzerland would use that uh, brand also of yeah. diamond paste, and For it just instantly works. You polish and polishing. it's like perfect very easily. Yeah, mm. and okay. uh, it, it's due to uh, uh, three parts: uh, the tools, the paste, and the technique. If you get those three done, it's extremely easy and fast to do black polishing. Mm. It's not like a me- very difficult, you need 20 years, that's all bullshit, of course it is. Okay. Uh, everybody uh, who is not a watchmaker can learn black polishing. Because that's one of the, the bench tests. You will black polish screws when you come on a bench test here. Mm. And you will see that it's not really that hard. There are much, much harder, more difficult things to, to do in watchmaking than black polishing. Mm. Uh, so the, uh, that's not it. Here they have to also be disciplined because if they drop the tool with the jewel the delicate jewel at the end it's instantly destroyed uh, so it will uh, test their patience and uh, it will test them that they don't compete because if they compete they crack it and then they have to restart from the beginning and so on. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they, really so have, they to have to be them. like i was in zurich uh, they will their feel own time zone yeah they have yeah it. yeah and an um, interesting dynamic happen when you have a, a group of international uh, students. So you have some students from maybe Italy, some mm-hmm. from, I don't know, Malaysia, some Asian country. And it becomes always very interesting when we have these courses. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I learn a lot about people too. What are you going to do after you finish the school here? <laughs> that depends on where I can get work. <laughs> I guess. Okay, so you uh, you want to go and work at a watch production house or or a more independent restorer or what do you have in well, mind? Uh, I mean, I think maybe like a small factory, like small, like yeah, independent kind of thing is probably the most interesting work thing, but I'm not sure mm. if many people can get that position. Okay, so where are you from? From Iceland. From Iceland. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Henrik was just saying different people from different areas. It's <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Are there any? Ah, oh, there is one. What? Which? Uh, which maker in Iceland that I've heard about? Mikkelsen. Maybe. It could yeah. be. I don't remember the name, but there was some uh, some guy. <laughs> KJ, uh, what, what do you want to do after you have? Uh, uh, my plan is to work at an uh, after sales service. Yeah, to just to work to gain accumulate more experience with watch service, movement service. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, boots on the ground experience. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then for long term we can yeah think what we are going to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, what do you have in, uh, in plan? I I just want to find a big retailer store to do the after service. Mm. to see as many different kind of watches as possible. Okay. Yeah, and then maybe 10 years later open my own workshop. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Where? My home country, Taiwan. In Taiwan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How is the watch uh, scene and watch making scene in Taiwan? We, we have some some people who can learn watch repair it and who can what uh, do the watch repair it, but they mm. most of they learn from the previous generation. So they picked up the skills themselves, and yeah, some 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 people do that. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. She <laughs> looks very busy there. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your plan, and uh, what are you working on? So far, I'm working on an antique pocket watch which is uh, Richard Gwen and Jump Hour combined together hmm. and I'm interesting about this because I want I like Richard Gwen I wanted to make it on my school watch so the best thing that I can learn is get a one mm-hmm. like a, probably doesn't have to be like a really good one but start it and try to re- repair it and I just put it in a machine and it's flashing clean right now just uh, 
removed all those little skunked out stuff and there's a lot of things that was being mixed out at, so I just took some pictures of of them mm -hmm. like they are supposed to be connected together <laughs> and there's a code which has a crack in between oh, so, really? yeah so which is interesting to find out oh what did they do <laughs> yeah uh -huh. yeah so you didn't know that before you just after cleaning figured that out yeah because it was all covered by very gunned up old oil or this kind of stuff black stuff so mm -hmm. i have to kind of clean it first to see what's inside Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And what is this brand you were saying? I don't even. I uh, haven't even heard about it. it. It's not. It's not really a. I never heard this brand before, and I didn't have much information online. So I've, I was guessing it's probably in the very olden days, and they make it like very small amount and very mm -hmm. unknown brand. Okay. Yeah. What did you figure out about them when you opened? <laughs> well, there's a, a lot of thing that was uh, completely <laughs> rust and. <laughs> wear out a lot but the quality seems to be not bad uh, it was the movement which is very thick one with the bridge and these two pins should be parallel to each other but one of them is bent yeah yeah okay yeah. so yeah another thing to do you can see that the color was changing that means it's friction for a very long time and mm -hmm. was uh, scraping it away Okay. Yeah. So and what's your plan with this uh, with this moment? Yeah. So far, I will be uh, now they are clean. So I will be try to put them together and surface it and see if something is wrong and going on. And mm. if some parts were too worn out, I have to probably make one because it's vintage. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's not a vintage, it's an antique. So it's yeah. probably not able to find it. And I can see from some parts that they are probably handmade. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> uh, the last watchmaker probably is um, they they repaired this probably very long time ago. Mm. So all the technique you can see that have this permanent arrow and it's also have a history on it. Mm. So sometimes we'll be like consider if we need to s s uh, keep this like it's part of history right now. Mm. They do some funny stuff to fix an arrow but create another one or not like proper way to do that mm. yeah all right <laughs> that's very interesting yeah thank you thank you a lot thank you Hendrik <laughs> thank you very much thank you everyone yeah. working and uh, <laughs> studying in this really epic school <laughs> and um, I think what you're doing is a, is a dream basically <laughs> I will have to call my brother back <laughs> and uh, that's it I think uh, I think you guys are uh, doing something very awesome mm. And uh, it's okay. cool to see that you're taking it uh, with a with a strong passion and dedication. Uh, yeah. I wish you all the best here. I'm sure you're going to take uh, this knowledge somewhere where uh, you can really put it to good use. Hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, smell of metal. Checking out at Corpela Hof's Watchmaking Center. Thank right. you, Hendrik. Thank you so much, Christian. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and. Uh, that's it. <laughs> All right, guys, that was it. Purple and Hops Wedgemaking Competence Center. I hope you learned something. I know I did. If you're thinking of studying wedgemaking in Switzerland, that's the place to be. Until next time, smell of metal, checking out.